good morning and welcome to CSIS. For those of you who haven't experienced our beautiful new building, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I'm John Alterman. I'm the director of the Middle East program, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you um, Walter Douglas. Walter was with us as a visiting fellow uh, a couple of years ago and worked on a very interesting project on engaging audiences in Muslim-majority countries. And, and the point that Walter was trying to work through was this problem that he had been out in the field uh, and felt that, that Washington was somehow disconnected from the field. And there had to be a way to not only go from Washington out, but also to the field in, especially when you're trying to to persuade audiences. Walter and I actually met out in the field. We met in Riyadh several years ago when he was uh, the spokesman for the embassy there. Walter, for those of you who know him, has had a, a large string of jobs talking to Muslim audiences on behalf of the United States, not only in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, where he was just before he came to CSIS. Uh, now he's in India, which has one of the largest Muslim populations in the world, although it's not a Muslim-majority country. Uh, I went and saw Walter in India about a year ago. And Walter brought the same combination of, of intellectual acuity and enthusiasm, which so much of us have come to appreciate through his career. Um, Walter started off in advertising, something I found a little bit surprising, because Walter has been focused from the beginning on how do you actually speak to audiences? Not only telling the audience what you want the audience to know, but how do you tell the audience in the way the audience wants to hear? And Walter did something that I think very few people in the State Department are able to do. Not only did he sit down and put his thoughts into a document, a document which I hope you'll read, but then he did what a lot of State Department officers do, is then he went through the clearance process. That explains a little bit of why, now that he's been in India for a year, he's back with us. I am delighted to welcome him here. I'm delighted to hear some of the ideas he conveys in his presentation. And then I'll look forward to helping moderate a discussion with all of you on his findings. So ladies and gentlemen, Walter Douglas. Thank you, John. Thanks. Uh, John, thank you very much for the introduction. As John said, we met in Riyadh in, uh, in 2006 when I was the PA over there. And actually, I see Bob Keith who was in Riyadh with me also at that time. But uh, anyway, we, we, we hit it off. And uh, I've always found him to be one of the uh, sharpest observers of what's going on in the Middle East. And uh, I find myself still quoting him uh, on what's going on uh, over the years. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to be back here with John. And when I was at CSIS, I sat up with the Middle East program, of which John's the head, and so was able to benefit from his input. And specifically, he read this report twice. Uh, first time, taking a very rough piece and shaping it, and then second time, refining it. So it would be nothing. It would be a shadow of itself without John's input. So thank you very much. I'd like to just thank a few other people who are here today uh, before I get into it. One is I should thank the State Department for giving me the detail to come over to state, uh, CSIS. Uh, and it was uh, 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 really an eye-opener for me. And a lot of the strategic thinking I learned uh, when I came here, I've been able to give back to the State Department in many of the things that we're doing in India today. Um, I'd also like to, Jeannie Neal is sitting up here in the front. You refer, I will, might refer to we sometimes, and she was with me. Uh, she was the intern on the project and knew nothing about uh, public diplomacy, I think, when she started and left as an expert. But she went through more reports and that sort of thing than I could ever imagine was a fantastic research assistant. So I just want to thank her, and I see her up there, and you'll see her name is on the report as well. Uh, Terrence Smith is here somewhere. Terrence was uh, at CSIS with me. And then he went to Fletcher and came out as an intern in India uh, this summer. And he actually helped do some logistics to finish up the report. 
And then, of course, nothing's final without thanking my wife and my family who are over there. And so they put up with me going to places like Riyadh and Islamabad without them uh, and probably drove the family a bit crazy that way. But I must say, uh, the result was I got to do this report and, uh, and see a lot more of the world that was very interesting. So thank you. Um, John was hinting at, you know, why this report? You know, how, what was the origin of it? And um, I hope some of you have had a chance to read it. It came up, it went up on the CSIS website last week. And uh, uh, I'm not going to go through it blow by blow because I think you can read it. But I just want to point out some of the things of how this came about and where it takes us. Um, but anyway, the, the, as John said, what was just fascinating is we looked at 26 reports since 9-11 dealing with the Middle East. And the, the most amazing thing is how few of them had spoken to the officers in the field. Yes, there were bits and pieces here and there, but nobody had really said, how do you actually do this stuff uh, overseas? And in a sense, so we, ha we had a lot of advice coming out from here, but the best that they could come up with is an, the overriding recommendation is just give public diplomacy more money. Uh, that's easy to do, but money doesn't solve all your problems. It's how you actually use it and how you employ it when you're overseas. And so that was one of the incentives for, for doing this. What actually goes on over there? How does it work? <clears throat> And so over the years, I've been associated with public diplomacy for quite a while, and it spent the past 10 years really working in that region, uh, uh, the Arab Middle East, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. And so it's a look at what our officers are doing in that region uh, to, to, to come up with um, uh, a number of suggestions, the challenges, uh, what faces us out there. Uh, I've stayed away from policy because that's really the White House's uh, 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 prerogative, uh, but really as implementers, what do we do overseas when we get there? I would like to say I have taken in a lot from what I've seen and heard, but everything I put in this report is mine. It is not the State Department's report. I came over on a detail, which means I could do some independent thinking. Uh, so I'd just like to make that because that was important through that clearance process uh, that I make sure I speak in my voice and nobody else's. Um, one of the, something else that, that really I think was very interesting coming out of this is sort of defining what public diplomacy is. There's been a lot of talk about that since 9-11, uh, but basically, and, and there's been a lot of reporting on it, but I don't think public diplomacy officers were asked to, to, ask to actually define what it is. And one thing that was really striking, I'm just gonna, one thing that came out in the report, but I find a very interesting part of it, is we, get, we hear a lot about messaging. Uh, Washington saying, are you messaging? Are you getting this message right? But public diplomacy really is something larger than that. Messaging is certainly something we do in the press, we get out there. But public diplomacy is a full panoply of programs and, 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 and uh, 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 platforms that we use to engage the audiences out there to make them more receptive towards American foreign policy. While messaging's one, what we really spend most of our money on actually are these public diplomacy programs that go on overseas. Adam Airely, who uh, 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 was, has always pointed out, and he repeats this so often, I can actually say something, it really is the sum of these two, the, these two things. Adam's no longer with the State Department, so I guess I can mention that. And it, it's certainly true, we probably spend uh, three quarters of our money working on programs such as Fulbright, international visitors, and really targeting those people that we think can make a big difference to the opinion landscape that's out there. And that way, in a sense, you have the rifled effect of, of targeting certain people who we think are, are very important, and then the, the, the shotgun effect when we use the media to reach broader audiences. And I think that's something that back in Washington was not fully understood, and that's something I really wanted to put in the report, uh, that it's not just messaging how you get your word out. It's not just messaging how you engage foreign audiences, and it's not just messaging how you sort of make them see what we're doing and, and uh, show them we've got a point of view that's very respectable. Um, I think it's important if you look at the cover of the report, if you see who's on there, it's not a spokesman who's on there. That is actually an English teaching officer. Uh, he's someone who was in Pakistan with me. And I thought that he really stood for that, that other side of public diplomacy that isn't often reported. But the fact is English teaching is something we use very effectively out there. We target to certain audiences that we think perhaps are more at risk. Uh, and, but it's, it's a way that we get out our word uh, to, to a different audience and give them a broader sense of what's going on in the world. And maybe they'll be able to inform other people about what's going on, as well as get ahead in their own lives, because English is such an advantage to anyone out there. But I thought it was really important to have that on the cover and not a spokesman at a podium. Finally, I'd like to say, just sort of wrap up why the report. Uh, I think there's something else that, that motivates a lot of us. Uh, public diplomacy officers in the field are very patriotic. And so many of us just feel really strongly about what we're doing. 
but nobody had really looked at who we were and what we were doing. In a sense, this is a report I wanted to come out and say, here's how we see what's going on overseas. Here's how, how we think it should be implemented. This is how we will take something that comes from the White House and then shape it for the audiences out there. But in a sense, the heroes of my report is that public diplomacy function in the State Department, and they really are the ones who are charged with leading the public diplomacy efforts worldwide, that I wanted to sort of tell their story and get out what goes on. And so that's why I took, what I've got here is I spoke to public diplomacy officers and non-public diplomacy officers, and over the years I've been engaging on this. This is a summation of this, but I really wanted to get that story from what goes on over there, because I think the real heroes here are all these, my colleagues in the State Department uh, that, are, that are overseas, working in very difficult environments, trying to get that word out, and engaging audiences, and making them more receptive towards our policy initiatives. If you look at the report itself, and I don't want to go through it all, but Basically, I, I think, as I said earlier, uh, I, I haven't engaged in the policy structure because that really is something the White House does. But what I've very much done is try to sort of give a how-to outline of how we do it overseas, some of the challenges and opportunities we have. And just to highlight a couple of them, uh, more than a couple, but one thing I, I think is very interesting is when we approach societies, I divided it in this for the report's sake, in telling America's story versus engaging uh, behaviors and attitudes within a country. And I think uh, a lot of people are sort of unclear exactly which one do we put emphasis on. And what I've said, as I've said throughout this report, is every country is going to be different. And that's why the guys in the field are so important, because they can help us work through what goes on out there. But to everyone should weigh up, wh what are we trying to do here? Uh, are we trying to engage to tell them about what we're doing about our policies? Or do we want to actually take people overseas who might turn, in, turn violent and sort of make it so, okay, they don't take that route. Not that they're necessarily going to love us, but simply that they don't go the violent route. And I think in this part of the world, after 9-11, it's a question we have to ask. And every country is different out there. Every one of them uh, will have a different percentage assigned to one side or the other. But it's one thing I wanted to highlight uh, very much. And I think not everybody understands that we sort of have these dual functions out there. I also felt, and I mentioned this in the report, that sometimes we even need a third office, and we created one in Pakistan, really to engage on that changing attitudes and behaviors, a little different than traditional press work or cultural affairs work and exchanges. And that it was really important to put out there that there are a number of different ways you can approach this question, even outside the existing structure in the embassies. In places like Pakistan and Afghanistan, we have so much money that's given to us to do public diplomacy. We have the luxury of being able to create anything we want. And that's what I was trying to capture here. But I think even offices without all those resources can do a lot to change things and to, to relook at the structure of what they do. Um, another point I brought across all the time is the diversity of audiences. Uh, one thing is you do hear people say the Muslims or something like that. And I really want to say there are many different audiences and many different types of Muslims believing a lot of different things out there. What's important is I think people in the field become very attuned to that right away and understand certain communities believe one thing, other communities believe another. Sometimes when you're back in Washington, people don't understand those, those differences so well. And I thought it was really interesting to sort of look at how the field looks at when they get into a country, trying to size up who's what, who is more susceptible to a message, who do we have to work harder with, who's important, who's not, that sort of thing. But the diversity out there is incredible. It also ties in with... Um, the need, therefore, to speak to these people in the languages that they speak. Uh, and I say this, in India, it's very funny, I, I constantly bring this up. You ever see two Indians speak in English to each other? Uh, basically, unless they don't have a, an Indian language in common, uh, in which case they will use English, but even the best English speakers, guys without an accent in our embassy will speak Hindi to each other. Uh, you get the same thing out in the Middle East. You can have people who can communicate wonderfully in English, but the moment they engage each other, they're using their own language. Therefore, as public diplomacy practitioners, we need to be in those languages. Uh, it's where they say what's most important to them. Uh, it's where you basically have to listen to them, to what they say, not rely on English. It's kind of interesting, those English language newspapers you see out there. Uh, I remember, actually, in Pakistan, I was speaking to a, um, an editor, and I said, could you tell me what, what, what are these about? He said, these are for you, the foreigners, in other words. This is not something that Pakistanis use to communicate with each other. And, uh, and I thought that was a really important insight. And it's one thing is we have to make sure we don't rely on the English language out there to try to interpret what's going on, because that's not where the real action is. It's in the vernacular. Uh, and it, it's very important to be there. I wanted to talk a bit about security, which I did in here. And I said, I made a, you know, obviously, 
in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, and Libya and Yemen could go into it today, uh, security is a huge concern for us. But in the other places, while we do have these embassies that are much more secure than anywhere else, real public diplomacy work takes place outside of embassies. In fact, I, I even argue that the people we want to reach generally don't come into our facilities. That's where the real value is, going into their institutions and meeting them out there. And I think that's something, I quoted Thomas Friedman who came to, I remember, uh, Turkey after the, uh, 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 the bombings at, in, in Turkey, and he looked at our, our new Iman uh, consulate and remarked how, how this was a bad message. It can be, or it's a, it's a difficult message out there, it can be, but as public diplomacy offers, the fact it offers, you get out of that environment. And you want to go to the people who, who really don't care what our, what our embassies and consulates look like. And that, that's absolutely vital. And that's why that's not such a key stumbling block for public diplomacy officers, except in those very high-risk security uh, posts that I just mentioned. But it's very important to see these other places. You get out. And that, that's what public diplomacy officers do. Um, finally, um, or not finally, sorry. For next steps in the report, and I hope you do all get a chance to read it, I set out a, a series of recommendations. I think one thing that was very important for them is, uh, and I go back to those 26 reports written since 9-11, uh, the, the one recommendation, as I said, for everybody was to uh, spend more money on public diplomacy. That's not going to happen. Uh, and basically what I tried to come up with, or I said Jeannie, with Jeannie's help, uh, was to, we came up with, were low cost or no cost solutions. Because the State Department's not looking to dump tons of money into something uh, uh, new. And in this budget environment, it's gonna be a while before they're able to do that. And so I think what we came up with, a lot of things we can do by certainly shifting emphasis, uh, looking at the field a little bit differently, real things that the State Department could do. Actually, I, I, I believe that some of them are underway to a certain extent. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to this afternoon going and speaking to a lot of people to find out just where we are that way uh, in, in, um, uh, in the State Department. Um, finally, let me wrap up and say uh, the limitations of this report, or it's a report, the limitation is obvious. It just dealt with one part of the world. But there is a whole world out there. People said, why didn't you cover Indonesia? That's, that's Muslim or something, Muslim majority. I think it'd be great if somebody does. Uh, I'm certainly, in India now, I'm finding a whole series of public diplomacy ideas that are different than I had in my report, because I'm dealing in a totally different environment, uh, where we're running a country, we're, we're working with a country with, say, 60 to 70 percent approval ratings. Very different than what we had in the region that's covered in this report. Uh, so what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is there were, there were limitations uh, just because of time, money, effort, all that sort of thing, but I'm hoping this will spark more reports to actually look at what we're doing overseas. I think this is an absolute vital area uh, that, that we understand public diplomacy. I'm delighted I'm going over to the State Department actually to speak to a number of people who do that, and I'm gonna give them a, a mini report on my report and talk about the importance of what goes on in the field as something very different than what they've seen here. I'm gonna stop there. What I'd really like to do, I hope I've given you a bit of an overview here. Uh, I hope you've got a copy of the report or if you've read it uh, or looking forward to reading it because I think there's a lot here that really will define something that hasn't been seen before. I was really glad that some of the um, academics that I brought into this project said, you know, we have not had a report from the field and they've been eagerly awaiting this. And as John mentioned, it was a little delayed in coming out. The research for this basically ended the summer of 2012. Uh, but. Uh, but now they have something in the public diplomacy courses where they can actually look at uh, uh, what we're doing in the field and try to make some judgments that might be a little different than what we'd hear uh, if they were relying solely on, on, on material coming out of here. So thank you very much, and I look forward to some questions and answers. Thank you, Walter. Um, as you suggest, there's a, a lot to chew on there. One thing that you didn't talk about at all in your report, really, was the issue of metrics. And one of the things I see in yeah. the State Department um, is a fascination with metrics for social media, because social media tends to produce very precise metrics. From your position in the field, what is your sense of the role of metrics? How do you use them, and how are people misusing metrics in ways that we have to yeah. stop? Metrics is a question that is really a difficult one for public diplomacy. You mentioned I was in uh, advertising before, and you always had, does the product sell or not? 
It was a very interesting metric. And if it didn't sell well, they'd fire the ad agency. So uh, you would pay uh, that way. Not that it was always the ad agency's fault, but they usually tended to blame the ad agencies first. Um, metrics are, are something that is very difficult. We know that public diplomacy and, and USIA contributed to the, the fall of the Soviet Union. But nobody's been able to measure exactly how that happened. Uh, we've talked about it, but it did play a role in undercutting the intellectual livelihood of the Soviet Union. When we get to today, trying to measure metrics, it's very difficult because you can measure inputs, but you can't measure outputs. There is some work done, and the private sector, mostly looking at when someone takes an action to understand that they have absorbed that idea. So example, I mentioned it's not just the tweets you do, it's the retweets that you have to count that you've actually scored something with this. Um, that's one way we do it. But nobody's really ca come up with an idea that says they have changed their way of looking at the United States based on what we have given them. Many have tried to do that, very difficult to do. But I did come up with a recommendation, and this is in, in over the years speaking to Hill people, uh, uh, Hill staffers, is they have said uh, one thing we need are narratives about what you're doing. How does this stuff play out writ large? And it's something I think we can all improve our, uh, in what we're doing, is putting together all these public diplomacy programs around the world in certain areas, say, what are they achieving? What, are we, what, what message are we getting out? Pointing to some success stories, not having the exact metrics saying, we moved the needle from, from you know, 50 to 60, but simply saying, we are putting out these ideas there. It is a concerted effort. It makes sense. And if your narrative makes sense, people can probably trust that you're onto something. Uh, I think that's one of the recommendations I have there is, Get, up to, get out to the Hill, get back to the State Department for the field, more with these narratives about what's going on. Um, and would that suggest that, that the number of people engaged, the number of people uh, who are in our audience is less important than creating a dynamic. And we, we need to be more tuned to the dynamics we create rather than the size of the audience. I mean, is it, I mean it sounds to me like you're, you're recommending a sort of looking at waves and, yeah. and, and, and creating ripples rather than, uh, rather than trying to, to measure the force. Uh -huh. Is that yeah, right? I think that's right. If you go on broadcast television, you get huge numbers. How many of those people are important to the, the influencing policy? That's, a, that's an open question. We have those exchange programs and other things we do on a narrow basis where we say that's someone who's important to the debate. We want to expose them more, maybe get the person on an exchange program with the United States where they can see what we do. So you're making judgments all the time about the value of the audience that's out there, some more valuable than the others. When you put it together, you try to then draw the conclusion of what you're getting out there, what words going out there, how much you're, 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 you're causing a debate. But to actually measure the impact is difficult. But you've got to put all these factors together on that one idea you want to get across. Then maybe there's another idea and how those blend together. But you've got to use all these tools. Uh, there are probably, at any one post, you could easily draw up a PD toolkit that would have 25 things that, are, uh, that we basically use, and it's all from using our local staff in the, in the vernacular language, to using the ambassador as a speaker, to using an econ officer as a speaker, to using the exchange programs, to bringing out speakers uh, into these countries. All these different things in our toolkit to get the message out, hitting different audiences that we think are important. But how you measure that impact, where it moves the needle, that's very difficult. As a manager, how, how do you think about the problem as you allocate your resources across the entire toolkit? Uh -huh. At the beginning of, of, of going anywhere, I think you have to sort of sit back and say, what are our objectives here? And try, try, and this is something I learned at CSIS and going through a number of exercises with you and others around here, was trying to say what the goals are up front. And don't worry about the implementation right away, but simply set out the strategic goals. I think there's a tendency often to mix implementation and strategic goals, and you've got to really see them as something separate, and then go reach into that toolkit of what works best in that environment. Uh, and that becomes a judgment call. It's probably more an art than a science. Uh, but for example, if you're in a very open country like India, uh, you can do a lot of things. I guess I'm getting out of my, my uh, uh, where the report is. You might have difficulties in other places where it's more closed. And in the Middle East, you find a tremendous variety of, of countries, some more open than others. 
but some can surprise you. Certainly when I was in Riyadh, I was amazed at how, how open they were to, ha to engaging on so many topics that people probably outside of Saudi Arabia don't realize. Uh, and when you were over there, I think you've been able to engage quite a few audiences, and you sort of know that receptivity to what's going on. Um, at any rate, you try to judge what's the best way to, to engage the audiences I want to reach. Uh, and usually there's always a blend of those two things, the broad media with a more narrow uh, 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 targeted approach. So let me just uh, pursue one other line uh -huh. before we open it up. You have mostly spent your career overseas, but you had a lovely year in Washington when you were <laughs> presumably part of a target for other embassies outreach programs, for other embassies' efforts at public diplomacy here in Washington. Um, who do you think was especially good? What kinds of things did you see as a target where you said, you know what, I recognize what they're doing and they're being effective, uh, and we should, we should try to take a page from that and do it when we go overseas? That's an interesting question. I guess one that struck me is how rarely I would think people did engage me. Uh, you know, it, often the, the officers who are working on specific countries, that one embassy will engage them. But engaging more broadly, you don't come across it as much in the State Department. That said, you do end up with some events. You do end up with certain things. But you were at CSIS. I mean, we're, right? <laughs> when I was here? Yeah. Yeah, um, we engage with a lot of uh, audiences, I have to say. And it was, it was very interesting. I don't think anybody targeted me the same way I would have expected. Uh, and I would think they could probably do more of that. I think that the think tanks, uh, at, at CSIS being my favorite, obviously, uh, have a lot of these ideas and a lot of these people they'd want to engage more with. Uh, but I, I don't see it as much as I, I would have expected. And certainly when I looked at audiences, at, 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 when I was here, I went to other think tanks as well as CSIS, and I looked at the audiences, and I was sort of struck by, there's some embassy people, but I would have expected more. Uh, and I think probably the, uh, uh, maybe it's because, and I mentioned this, the public diplomacy function in the State Department is kind of unique. Other countries don't seem to quite have it the same way. Uh, and so I found that State Department people were, were much more around the city, getting around, and I see that overseas, engaging with think tanks overseas. I notice other countries may be doing a bit less than we do, and perhaps because they don't have a dedicated function. They'll have a spokesman but not a guy who sees that broader picture of, of how am I going to engage that foreign audience? How am I going to influence it about what we're doing? I see that less and less. Interesting. Um, I, as I look in the audience, I see a lot of people who know a lot more about public diplomacy than I do. So let me turn it over to you. Yes, sir. If you could um, do me a favor, three things. Wait for a microphone. Identify yourself. Um, and to uh, ask only one question until we've had a chance to, to go around the room. Thank you so much, uh, Douglas, uh, a good presentation. Uh, my name is Akbar Khwaja. I'm a World Bank retiree, um, originally from Pakistan. Uh, your recommended approach uh, in Muslim countries, is it same yardstick for kingdoms like Saudi Arabia or, uh, you know, military generals like, uh, you know, some of the a Middle Eastern country and Pakistan like a democratic country. Thank you. Yeah. Well, one thing that really comes out here is, is, is the variety that's out there and that we have to shift gears. And I, at one point, I, I talk about like to, a good Arabist can take 15 years of training, the kind of guy who can understand you know, uh, uh, differences in the, the, the regional cultures, the local cultures, the different Arabic that's spoken out there. So I think that what's important is I think we do recognize the diversity, and everybody who works overseas sees that. And what works in Saudi Arabia isn't necessarily something that's going to work in, in Jordan. Uh, they have different levels of, of uh, openness. For example, in Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, we had a, 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 an American archaeology uh, team out there, and that was something kind of new and different. But in Jordan, they've had them there for 100 years, uh, even longer. Uh, or even going back into the Ottoman days. It's nothing special there, or it's something special in Saudi Arabia. It's different. Uh, every country, you have to sort of look at it as, as, as a different activity. And that's one reason why so much I believe in you have to have the guy in the field, the, the man or the woman, trying to understand and interpret these societies, and then getting back and saying, what works best here? Because as you said, some are open. Some have a, a, a democratic political process. Others don't. Others ha have um, uh, a, a monarchy. All these 
systems really demand a different parts of the toolkit that go into action. How do you think about working a monarchy? I mean, you're now in the world's largest democracy, but you've served in, in one of the world's yeah. most important monarchies. How, how do you think about the targets for public diplomacy in a system where you're not trying to target elected officials? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, some people say there's an audience of one uh, when you have a monarchy, but uh, I think it is much broader. There are a lot of influences there. Uh, the king goes out and regularly goes on, on uh, uh, trips to meet his, his uh, I guess, his subjects. And so there are a lot of people giving advice. And so I think the important thing is who are those people who are opinion leaders there? And you want to engage them as much as possible. Uh, I think all over that region you deal with very varying degrees of democracy and uh, uh, lack of democracy, but you still always have people who influence the debate. You're always going to have a guy who will go on TV and talk about something. Uh, talk shows are huge business out in this part of the world. Those guys, even if they support the government, will have different ways of portraying it. Uh, and then there are those who don't support the government so much who will have a different way. So I think the key thing is to find out who are those people. For example, a systematic watching of television, something <laughs> kids are really good at, uh, is can often, you'll, you'll find who are the people who speak most about the subjects you want. And within three weeks of, say, watching, you can come up with, oh, I, I'm noticing these certain people keep coming up. And they are influencing the debate in some degree. You, you probably want to engage those guys. Uh, they're they're going to be important to you. Uh, and so I think it's listen, look at, look at who's out there, and, and come up with who are those people who are important. It's not just the one guy at the top. Hi, Bruce Gregory, uh, George Washington University. Uh, you make a strong case for looking at public diplomacy in the field and for the most part looked at the State Department's role in the field. But you've also served in large platform embassies where there are a variety of departments and agencies of the U.S. government. And in India, you have an annual strategic dialogue that involves many, many different agencies. Could you reflect on who does public diplomacy uh, in the field in addition to the State Department, and what's the State Department's role in leveraging those actors? Yeah. Well, certainly one I can think of in a lot of these places is USAID. And in Pakistan, there was a huge USAID operation there. Uh, in India, it's much smaller. In other countries, it varies. In Egypt, it's huge. Uh, and it, it varies everywhere you go. They are certainly influencing the public debate out there. Uh, they do have a public role. It's a bit different than, say, what the State Department is. They generally coordinate with us in everything they do. Or, and, uh, and so you hope there's a unified message going out. But they're certainly key communicators when you're overseas. But there are some other agencies like that. Uh, uh, Health and Human Services can be a big one, uh, generally doing CDC. There are all these other people who are out there doing things. The key thing is you want to capture a lot of the good works that they're doing and explain why it's important what they do and show, say, that partnership between the United States and these other branches of government. It's not just strict policy. There are a lot of these th other, other things that are going on. And it's important that people see them. You're right, though. Uh, in my report, I've really just focused on the State Department because, I, as I mentioned, we have the lead role. But there are a lot of others who support the efforts and give a lot, do a lot to, to support public diplomacy. Right here. It's coming. Good morning. I'm Penn Agnew from the Bureau of Middle East North African Affairs at the State Department. Walter and I work together in the Office of Press and Public Diplomacy. Uh, Walter, I'd love to hear your comments on how you approached uh, issues of religious faith and tolerance, both in Saudi Arabia and in Pakistan, and some of the creative programs that I know you did in, uh, in Saudi Arabia I think would be of interest. But I'm, what I'm really curious about is how you uh, avoided uh, an inflammatory uh, uh, exchange or engagement, but rather kept it uh, at more at an, uh, a level of mutual understanding and of interest in, in uh -huh. uh, the issue on both sides. Yeah. Religion is, is a fascinating one. I, I, I speak about it in my report, is that I, I think we have to realize the Establishment Clause isn't to avoid religion. It's a void to a specific religion, and that it's a very effective way to engage people. I keep thinking of someone who came out to Saudi Arabia when I was there uh, who, who was Jewish and his father had recently died. And in the Jewish faith, you, you read every day uh, uh, certain passages from the Torah elsewhere uh, to honor your father. 
And when he mentioned that to Saudi audiences, he said, that's just great, honoring your father through your religion. They, they just love that. So here was someone where he was quite open about what he was doing religiously, and they respected that. I think we have to be open about that. It's something that's very important for them. There's probably there's much more religion in their, in, their, in their daily debate than you might find here. And I think we can't shy away from that, but rather embrace it as something that's, that's very worthwhile. Uh, and explaining, well, I guess, I guess one thing that, that, explaining how the United States is religious, that's always a surprise for audiences when they come here. I quote a, a, a journalist who said when he was studying in Boston, he, there were something like 10 churches on his block or within a you know, one block radius of where he was. And he, he never realized Americans were so religious. And Al Jazeera did a program on Islam in America and found out to their surprise that it was pretty good and that the religious situation was good here. I think that's something that is a, a, a barrier and, and, and breeds a lack of trust in who we are because religion is so important to them and sometimes what they see coming out of America, say on a television show and a movie or something like that, it doesn't portray that as much as that is part of our lives. And I think in the State Department we have to embrace that, not proselytize obviously, I'm not saying that, but be very open about that we are religious and believe that too because it opens a lot of doors for you. Uh, when, 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 when you speak about that. The, the other piece, of course, is when American religious figures do things that are polarizing yeah. in the Middle East or seem to be disrespectful. Is there, a, is there anything you can do other than explain, you know, nobody speaks for the government and we have a big, messy democracy? We do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a couple of very well-publicized cases recently in which we, we, we need to consistently engage on that and try to explain the First Amendment. The First Amendment is a, a, a tough one because to, most countries don't have it. I mean, we're it, uh, in a sense. And there are a lot more restrictions, even in Western Europe, on what you can say than the United States. It's a hard concept to get across because those people can use that uh, and they generally can get a lot of press, even though they have a very small following in the United States. So while you can talk about the First Amendment, you also have to explain that these are not mainstream people, that what they're saying is not something that a lot of Americans are picking up or a lot of Americans feel. Yes, certain ones do. Uh, but the best, uh, the, the, the best defense is to be open as you can about it. Don't try to ignore it. Don't try to hide it. Try to explain it. Uh, and, uh, and in some ways, let, these, let the message fall flat in the United States and, and say, okay, what effect has this had on what we do? And often the, 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 the proof is it, it has very little effect on us. So, uh, but we're constantly dealing with those, those, those guys. Uh, and it's, uh, it's troublesome, uh, it, it's, but we, we have to explain this is our society and how we do it. But look at the results. Do they throw back at us the same, the same thing of, of well, all the people who are endorsing terrorism, you throw us all in the same, oh, yeah. in the same basket? Yeah, yeah, that's right. We, we hear that constantly how varied you know, Muslims are. And, uh, and when you're in the field, you really get a good sense of that and appreciate it. You realize most of them are like you and me. You know, they just uh, uh, want to live a middle class life, get their kids educated, all that. Uh, a lot of them recognize the problem they've got. Uh, I, when I was in Pakistan, one of my, these guys, a very senior government official I became friends with, used to say, you know, America, don't abandon us. You're our best hope. Uh, it's not a message you hear back here very often. But it's sort of something that's felt there. Um, when I was, right after we killed bin Laden, I, I was there. And uh, I was talking to the driver. And it turned out he was from Abbottabad. And I said, wow, have you ever seen the house and, uh, where bin Laden was? And he said, uh, uh, I haven't, but my family's all going by it now. Everybody's driving by and walking by and looking at it. And he said, you know, I'm really glad you got that guy. Because last August, my brother-in-law was in a market in Peshawar, and a bomb went off. He was just buying melons or something like that. And, and he was killed. And so my sister and her three daughters, or three children, don't have a father, and she's moved back in with us. And so he said, these guys cause a lot of trouble here, and I, you know, I'm, I'm glad you did what you did. That's a message you don't hear back here as much. Uh, but on a daily basis when you're out there, you hear that a lot. And these are people who are trying to distinguish themselves from the stereotypes of what Muslims are like. Uh, and they're just speaking from their heart. And you can't help but be affected by it and understand those, those, those differences in a society. Are there troublemakers out there? Sure, there are. Uh, but most of those societies know it as well, and they don't like it any more than we do. Thank you. So a question all the way in the back. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Lynn Weil, and like Penn and a number of others in this room, I've overlapped with Walter professionally. Uh, first, while I was a Capitol Hill staffer and led a staff delegation to the region, he was very gracious to help us with that. And then later, uh, during his last days with the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, for whom I then worked for a year and a half. Now I'm at the Broadcasting Board of Governors, where our governing board has an opportunity to change the emphases and focuses of the agency over time. And in the wake of 9-11, for example, they created the Middle East Broadcasting Network, Al Hura TV and uh, Radio Sawa. And I wondered, Walter, if you'd like to address how the personalities and changing uh, emphases of the undersecretaries over time may have affected how the uh, Muslim-majority countries are approached either through the way the United States speaks to them through public diplomacy or programs that have been launched uh, or relaunched over time. Thank you. <laughs> That can be a minefield. <laughs> um, I can speak most about the one I worked for, Judith McHale. And uh, her approach was kind of different and one that I think still lives on today in a way I very much like. And that is that when USIA merged with the State Department in 1999, uh, it wasn't a complete merger and a lot of strategic planning function didn't follow uh, from USIA. And she'd been head of discovery and realized the importance of bringing that in. And I thought she did a very good job of giving us a tool to do strategic planning and to get us really focusing on that. This was 10 years after the merger. And uh, uh, it's invaluable. I think more work needs to be done on that. But I certainly think this planning, we've got limited resources. And the more you can plan what's important and not spend your money and your resources on uh, personnel and all that on what's, what's unimportant, that, that makes a huge difference. I think one of the diff most difficult thing about, things about that position is how much it's been vacant. And Matt Armstrong uh, has written about it in his blog, Mountain Runner, about I think the position's been vacant about a third of its existence. And the turnover's been pretty fast there. That hurts public diplomacy. Uh, we'd like to have people in there and, and, and emphasizing what we can do and putting resources and, and giving some direction to what we do. Uh, Why do you think it's been empty so, so much? It's an interesting question. I would think there are a lot of people who want to do it. And usually when I've spoke to, spoke, spoken with them, they, they enjoyed it. Someone like James Glassman, who only got six months at the job, uh, said he, he really had a great time and, and, and uh, wished he could do more. And my sense is that uh, it's harder. They have generally looked out uh, at, at, they don't use career people there. So to find the right person who's out there, who they think can do the job, they, I mean, the seventh floor of the State Department, uh, takes a little more time, uh, perhaps, than, than something else. But um, uh, probably every case is separate, individual, why one takes a long time to fill. I mean, Judith McHale came in quite ra quickly uh, when the Obama administration came in. So clearly, you know, they moved very quickly to, to bring her in as fast as the confirmation process would allow. I'm not sure why, on an individual basis, the others took so long. Uh, and uh, uh, I wish it, it weren't like that. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Walter. Mike Schneider from the Maxwell School. I wonder if you could describe for us uh, some of the ways in which your program in Saudi Arabia tried to foster civil society. Uh, okay. Well, I guess I, I was there at a time, 2006, 2007, we just had a number of hot, spectacular terrorist attacks earlier. The Saudis were doing a lot on their own and have done a lot on their own for it. But I guess what we were just trying to present is a, a, a view of how the United States works, is that maybe there's some things there they could see uh, uh, that would be worth borrowing. And um, part of it was just exposing people to the United States in a way they never had before. and. Uh, it was everything from using Muslim Americans in Mecca to talk about things like how we deal with health problems to a photo exhibit that we worked with National Geographic with Tom Abercrombie, their great Middle East guy, really introduced the Middle East to the United States. And with that photo exhibit, we could go to places that Americans traditionally didn't go. We, we partnered with the so Saudi Ministry of Culture uh, to do that. And hoping that when people saw that, some of those, those ex the extremists there would say, well, maybe America's not all that bad. 
and that therefore maybe dislike of America is not something, these extremists would say, that's going to get us the mileage, that there's another side that make them hesitate and say maybe, you know, well, not all Americans are, are, are bad. I, I look right in front of you at uh, Sophia Kilji, who was with me in Saudi Arabia, who was very innovative in going out and working with a lot of these communities and places where American uh, embassy people had not been before. And uh, she, she was a wonderful asset to have with us. But I think just the exposure to an American like that could talk to them somewhat about, about who they were. There was a, another project out there that I, I greatly admired, and that was, uh, uh, it, it was a breast cancer project, uh, tying up Susan B. Komen Foundation with MD Anderson out in Texas. And uh, uh, breast cancer was a terrible problem there, and Saudi Arabia was not equipped to handle it. And so tying the awareness of Susan B. Komen with the treatment of MD Anderson was a wonderful project out there that women came together, but fully supported by men. They all have wives, daughters, and that sort of thing. Uh, and that I thought was just a, a brilliant program to sort of show how you can tackle this problem in what you might say civil society in a, in a very, very fine way, using us as the example. Because we do that. We tie the awareness together with the treatment. Stuff like that, I think, uh, uh, had a lot of impact. And judging from the Saudis you'd speak to and the, the, the media attention it got and the attention from the king uh, uh, tells you that we were onto something there. Can you say a little more about gender? Um, sure. I think that there's sort of a presumption that farm policy is, is a man's game. <laughs> but I know from, from what I know of your programming that, that like with Susan B. Komen, I mean, you were, you mm -hmm. were reaching out to all kinds of audiences. As the United States thinks about engaging broadly, and we know that women play roles in families determining who participates in boycotts and those mm -hmm. sorts of things, how should we think about engaging women as distinct complementary to male audiences? And, and uh, to what extent should we just say we're going to talk about foreign policy and whoever's mm -hmm. interested will come? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the thing is you have to engage women on, on both levels as professionals, as foreign policy, as they, they fit those opinion leader positions because while there might be fewer of them, there are women out there in all these societies who have an impact. Uh, uh, to watch Lebanese TV is to see all those uh, uh, announcers and reporters who are women and realize that NBC is broadcast quite broadly in the Middle East uh, and that they are certainly, you're going to engage Partly them Partly because so many of the presenters are so attractive. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes, <laughs> you know, the fact is they are presenting news and points of view, and there you want to uh, work with, with them on, on those very serious, hardcore uh, political issues. But I, I think then in looking at how you engage a, a larger grouping, you have to find what's important to them and make sure the things we're talking about are important to them. So, for example, if you sit there talking about glass ceilings and corporations or something and things like that. That's important for a very small group. Uh, it's important, but it's not a broad-based broad effort. I think what you have to do is look at something that perhaps does have a larger impact uh, on women, uh, and that can be education, it can be gender-based violence, it can be all these other things that really hit a broader society. And maybe share some of our ideas and really share. It's not about lecturing or doing anything like that. You have to show what we do and see where they can borrow something that might fit with their society. Uh, you can't impose this on them. Uh, and they will work in their, at their own speed and at their own time to do it. But probably exposing them to some of our better practices can't hurt. You've also got to explain the things we do that aren't so right. Uh, and one of the things you get is uh, especially they might look at certain aspects of our society. Some of our, our TV shows show quite a lot of licentiousness in America. And you have to put those in context with what they are. One, they are television shows and not reality. Uh, and you have to deal frankly with these issues. Because I found that sometimes these make the greater barriers to, to uh, uh, understanding the United States uh, than anything else. Is they see that portrait of America, whether it's accurate or not, or generally it's not accurate, and say, I, I don't like that. And you say, well, there's more to America than what you see on those shows. That uh, reality TV isn't reality? <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Springer presents a view of America. Uh, and they certainly watch it and love it. But I also like to think that Oprah, I think, is the most popular show out there and probably puts a more positive image out, but also speaking about real women's issues uh, to a broader audience. So you've got to make sure they see maybe a little bit more Oprah and a little less Jerry Springer. Excellent. It's a question right here, sir. 
Hi, I'm uh, Stephen Canna, retired from the U.S. Council for International Business, and I'm looking at the paragraph called the private sector, and you say a free conversation with private sector executives might be an inexpensive alternative. So if I'm the head of the IBM office in Mumbai, and my job is to make IBM Global a seamless operation, what can I do? What should I do? Do I want to get engaged with this? And it's sort of like walking on eggshells. Uh, so to what extent can U.S. global companies play a positive role yeah. without um, cracking the eggshells? Sure. Well, it's interesting because we, we do work with those. If you take something like Microsoft, they have every interest in intellectual property rights is that we do, and they go are very vocal about it. They have they bring people together, they send them off, uh, uh, including on training programs in the United States. So they do a lot of things like that. So a lot of companies that are, are augmenting what we do or complementing what we do for their own reasons, but they happen to uh, uh, hit a lot of, of, of our ideas. One thing I was mentioning though about that, what I thought was so interesting, and I really saw this in Pakistan, we put out um, with AID a contract to, to, uh, to ad agencies. And the res I was part of the committee to choose one. And I found that, and I'd been in advertising so I could, I could read through some of the mumbo jumbo they put there. And what was interesting is when you have an ad agency talk about what works, you're not just getting the guy thinking about your one thing. There's some guy with 20, 25 years experience selling products there and has a good sense how this stuff works. So one thing that came through in a lot of these contracts, for example, was that don't use SMS. That's spam. Uh, and at the time in Washington, we got, use SMS. So who are you going to believe, you know, kind of thing. Well, I think these ad agencies who are really trying to move product and all that have a good sense of what the tools are, what can work and what can't. Um, I think we can also learn from some of the failures. I, I mentioned a McDonald's campaign in here that was covered in the New York Times about how they thought they were doing one thing, but social media backfired on them, and it, came, it, it turned out to be something very different. I think we can learn from what these companies do. But my, my final conclusion, and it's funny because when I go back to India, I have a guy right now hooking up a, a session with an ad agency, and I say I want them to tell them for, for an hour, why don't you just go over there, what would we be surprised to know about how, how you uh, uh, communicate in India? Uh, I think there's a lot of experience that we can tap into there. We tend not to be so good marrying with the, the, the private sector on that, but they've got a lot of experience and can tell us an awful lot. We have time for one more question right there, sir. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, Richard Lee Smith from the British Embassy. I just, uh, I feel I need to ask a question just to show that uh, we are here and we are listening. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about the balance um, between uh, effort from Washington and effort in country. Obviously, you're blessed here with a huge number of foreign journalists. Um, uh, to what extent can, can you use them to influence the message that you receive in, in country? And, uh, uh, and, and what, what sort of have been the best experiences you've heard of that, of that happening? What's that last part then? What's Your sort of good examples of engagement of the, of the foreign uh -huh. media here to, uh, to influence. Okay. Um, we regularly engage the foreign journalists that are there. And we do it, one, with, especially with the Americans out of courtesy because they are fellow Americans who we, we're there to help out. But also one thing that's very interesting is how what they write can boomerang right back into the society. And uh, uh, the fact is, say, when I was in Pakistan, anything that appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, New Wall Street Journal, was covered and entered into the debate there. So we found them very valuable to public diplomacy simply to make sure they have our perspective and what's going on. Um, we also know that they engage with an awful lot of people in whatever host country you're in. And so uh, uh, just by the questions they ask, you learn a lot about a country uh, when, when, we, when we have chats with them. Um, the, one of the difficult things, though, is they have difficulty getting access to a lot of these places. Uh, some countries let them in, some don't, some throw them out, some have minders. So it, it's not something, you can't use them everywhere all the time that way, or they're just not around. Uh, they usually you always will have a wire reporter or something like that, but he's often a, a local. Uh, but to get a New York Times or Washington Post guy in there is something different. In Pakistan, we were very spoiled because almost every major media organization had a, had a representative there. 
Uh, in India, I can say, although it's outside the scope of this report, New Delhi is a huge hub for international journalists, and, and every major medium is there. Uh, so wherever we are, we like them, we use them, we think it's important to communicate to them if they ask us questions, but they also are not our, our target. Uh, you know, who, they're not the guys we're out there to reach. Uh, it's sort of what we do in addition to reaching out to whatever the, the host country is. Uh, and I think that's always something to be aware of. Um, for us, a real success is when we see a story that appears, say, in, in, the, the, uh, in the Middle East press or in Al, Al Jazeera, something we've worked with them on, much more than if something were to appear on BBC. Uh, and once again, I also get back to that vernacular trust and all that, that certain organizations will, 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 will burrow deeper and have a broader audience than others. So we want to be sure we're, we're clear who we're really trying to you know, work with the most here. Walter, I want to thank you for presenting not only a, a fascinating report, but also a really broad ranging discussion that demonstrates just how rich a field public diplomacy is. I wanted to thank you all for coming, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah. <laughs>